This is the third in a series of four lectures on 2 Corinthians, and we're looking now at some of the elements or attributes in the successful ministry. Thus far, we've seen that the ministry, if it's blessed of God, is a triumphal one. It is a sincere one, an approved one, a dependent one, a superior one, and an open one, a Christ-honoring one, and a suffering one. We've looked somewhat at this subject of suffering. We said that uh, the nature of this suffering is described by the Apostle Paul and then the victory through this suffering and now the results from this su suffering. Some of the immediate blessings is found here where Paul says that he had the privilege then of bearing the marks of Christ. In chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And another blessing, immediate blessing, that is of, sh of sharing the privilege of sharing the glory of God down here. Let me zero in, though, on this uh, blessing of bearing the marks of Christ. I think that's to share his sufferings. I've said so often that uh, at one time I thought my life verse was going to be Philippians 3.10. And I used to have a little plaque that says in my room at Moody Bible Institute that I might know him, the power of his resurrection. And one day I learned, though, that the rest of that verse says, and the fellowship of his suffering. And I think prob probably Paul enjoyed the power of the resurrection more than maybe any other man that ever lived because he was willing to endure the fellowship of the suffering. And you can have, I do not believe, the first, the power, without the second, the suffering. I think there are two areas in which Christ suffered. He suffered by being rejected or forsaken by man, and he suffered by being forsaken by God. Now, do you remember... Certainly, he was forsaken by man. A man ridiculed him, and, and uh, he was uh, poked fun at because he came from Galilee. In fact, one of his own followers at one occasion had said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth in Galilee there? That's where the hillbillies lived in those days. So he was sort of forsaken by uh, the religious world in which he lived. And then on the cross, he cried out the fourth statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So the believer uh, suffers the marks of Christ when he is forsaken by man for his stand. And then there are occasions where it seems that he is forsaken by God. <clears throat> of course, he isn't, but it seems that way. But <clears throat> by suffering this way, Paul then was bearing the marks of Christ, going through what Jesus went through a small scale, and then he had the privilege of enjoying or sharing the glory of God. In verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, even suffering now, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now that's the immediate blessings that Paul, his ministry, even though it was a suffering one, enjoyed. And then future blessings, of course, he looked forward to the resurrection. Verse 14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So future blessings would include the resurrection of the human body as well as rewards. Paul says in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, and that's to be compared with all eternity now. It's for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, the material things on this earth, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All right, now let us look at another element in the ministry. It is a confident one. It is a confident one. The believer, as he uh, lives his life in the sphere of the will of God, 
and performs his ministry there, whatever it may be, will never have to say, well, uh, God's called me to do a certain thing, and, and I don't know whether this thing's going to work or not, but let's try it. He knows it's going to work. He can be confident, not arrogant, but confident that the things that God has called him to do will be done. He can say with the fullest assurance, a statement that Paul once said, For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The child of God never has to say, Well, back to the old drawing board. We tried this, and this is what God led us to do, but God made a mistake, and we have to... to uh, Go back and try it again. Uh, This is a confident ministry, and it's confident. Uh, The man can have the confidence at the present time because of the Holy Spirit that lives in the heart of the believer. Chapter 5, verse 5. Paul says his ministry was a confident one because he knew that God at the present time, in which he wrote, had given us, quote, the earnest, literally the seal or the pledge of the Spirit. So we have the confidence that the Spirit of God lives within us and is going to guide us and direct us and pray for us, according to uh, Romans chapter 8. And then we can have confidence concerning the future. Uh, What is this confidence? Well, in chapter 5, Paul says, For we know, that's confidence, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So this is a confident ministry if it's of God. Then it is a compelling ministry. I can understand the apostle's statement when he said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. And the minister of God will never receive a reward for preaching. Now he will receive a reward for faithful preaching, or for perhaps the lack of faithful preaching, he won't get a reward, Uh, but the love that Paul had for Christ, it compelled him. It was a compelling ministry, and Jesus said, when we've done the best we can do, we are then unprofitable servants. But the, the real minister must preach. He has no choice. He must preach. The ministry is a compelling one. And there were at least five compelling reasons or factors which prompted Paul to work day and night in the ministry and to literally work his fingers to the bones. Number one, because of the judgment of the saints. Notice chapter 5, verse 10, where the apostle Paul said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now, in the book of Hebrews, and I think this was written by the apostle, he amplifies this statement as far as why his ministry was a compelling one. In Hebrews 13, verse 17, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. In other words, uh, one of the reasons that Paul worked day and night is because he knew that he was going to be responsible uh, for his converts and their spiritual growth at the judgment seat of Christ. And so he worked long, hard hours so that someday at the judgment seat, God would say to him, you have been a faithful shepherd. You see, again, this verse, obey them that rule over you and submit yourself, for they watch for your souls. They must give an account. And the minister who properly understands this uh, will have this compelling factor in his heart, this holy get up and go, If for no other reason, I'm going to have to give an account how I've uh, lived my life at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's one of the reasons, because of the judgment of the saints. Another, because of the need of sinners. Chapter 5, verse 14. Because, Paul says, we thus judge, or this is the conclusion of the matter, that if one died for all, and Christ died for the world, then we're all dead. 
So Christ did not come to show us how to live a better life. He came because we were spiritually dead. And Paul would later uh, amplify on this program uh, as far as uh, by one man sin entered to the world and then death passed upon all men. He does this in Romans chapter 5. Uh, but he realized that he didn't see just human beings and Roman soldiers and housewives and and Jews and, and uh, Greeks. A lot of times the Jewish world separated people between whether they're Jews or Greeks. But he saw men and women with immortal souls in their bosoms, men and women uh, who would live forever, either in heaven or hell, and uh, people who would die and go to a devil's hell unless they were born again. So he realized that everybody was lost, that everybody needed to be saved, and that compelled him to get into uh, the harness there and work for the Lord. Someone has said, and I think we brought this out so many times, that there are three things necessary for the salvation of a sinner. Uh, number one, there is the Word of God. Nobody was ever saved apart from the Word of God. Secondly, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit must bless the Word. And of course it will, or he will, if it's preached right. And thirdly, the word of God, the spirit of God, the messenger of God. God doesn't shout out the plan of salvation, and he doesn't scream out the four laws of the Roman, Romans road or the four spiritual laws to a sinner uh, from some uh, heavenly vantage point. He uses redeemed sinners to reach unredeemed sinners that they might be saved also the only difference between a sinner and a saint is the savior of course and uh, so god wants to use me to reach other sinners our definition you remember of a soul winner is this a soul winner is is a beggar telling another beggar where he found bread so one of the reasons this ministry was such a compelling one is because of paul's attitude toward people. He realized that they were lost. Another reason, because of the terror of the Lord. Verse 5, or chapter 5, and verse 11. He says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And not only, now we're not absolutely sure whether he's talking just about the severity of God's judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, uh, the Bible doesn't teach purgatory. Uh, the Bible does teach there will be a fire at the judgment seat of Christ, and, and our works will be burned up with fire, and maybe so embarrassing we'll want to jump in and be burned up with it. Uh, but uh, God's going to be pretty severe with believers concerning matters of service at the judgment seat of Christ, and maybe this is what Paul was talking about. Or he may have been talking about the, the terror and the severity of the Lord at the great white judgment throne, whatever because of God, because of Paul had that reverential fear and that, uh, that uh, holy respect for God that should characterize every believer. And Paul's fear, of course, that he, was might, he might displease his glorious master. A friend of mine who graduated from high school at the same time I did in 1950, uh, joined the service, and he was attached to General Curtis LeMay's uh, private airplane uh, in the uh, Air Force. And, and uh, he said on one occasion uh, the plane landed, and, and, uh, and I don't know where it was, what city it was now. It was one of the large cities, uh, Chicago or Detroit or something. But uh, they told him uh, that uh, they were taking on a special passenger, and they did. This was in the 50s. And uh, my friend, his name was Ronnie, and he was a cook. And he said, now, you're going to uh, uh, be cooking for an important person that we just picked up, and he hasn't had breakfast yet. And so he said, all right. So he said, he's in the private place, uh, uh, room in that plane. You go in and talk to him. And Ronnie said they were, he was telling me this. He said, we were airborne, actually, we were about uh, 25,000 feet in uh, this uh, big Air Force plane. And so he walked in. And uh, he about swallowed his tongue, for there the President of the United States, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, was seated, and he was hungry, and he wanted breakfast. So he ordered uh, bacon and eggs, I believe it was, and toast, and Ronnie went back, and he said, with fear and trembling, he made those uh, eggs and, and cooked that bacon, 
Now, he wasn't afraid if he uh, made a mistake, uh, cooked the bacon too much or didn't cook the eggs enough that the president would throw him off the plane or have him shot or even uh, run him out of the service. But uh, he, had a, he had a reverential fear and a respect lest he might displease president, even though Mr. Eisenhower might not, nice, not, might not say anything about it. Yet he wanted, to, he wanted to please his commander in chief. And this is the respect that Paul had. And he did not want to do anything to displease the Lord. And because of this, it was a compelling factor that kept him working day and night. And the fourth factor that compelled him to work in the ministry so hard was of the love of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Now, if you have uh, a mission burden on your heart and the reason that you want to go to the mission field or whatever is because of those poor, uh, suffering pagans, uh, you may as well forget it. Uh, certainly that ought to be a part of the of the ministry call that we have compassion on other people, but unless the love of Christ prompts us to go, uh, then we become humanistic missionaries like Albert Schweitzer. Uh, world uh, sort of uh, looked upon him as the great humanitarian of his day, and he well may have been, humanly speaking, but he was an agnostic, and he was just concerned about the pagans in Africa. And he went over there and he built a hospital and doubtless he, uh, he prolonged the physical life of a number of them. But what happened after they died? They went to a devil's hell. Uh, they just uh, went there a few years later than they normally would have gone. As far as we know, Albert Schweitzer himself did not go to heaven, uh, let alone uh, lead anybody else there. So it's not just to fill the bellies of starving children, as important as this is, and I'm not minimizing that at all. Sometimes the only way to reach a man's soul is through his belly. But I'm saying that Paul's ministry here was a compelling one because, among other things, it was prompted uh, and directed by the love of Christ. And uh, number five, the fifth reason that compelled him to go day and night was because of the power of the gospel, because Paul knew what the gospel could do. Chapter 5, verse 17 is one of the great verses in the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new, because of the power of the gospel. These, then, are the reasons you and I should work for Jesus in the ministry. I'm talking about the ministry that he's given to each of us. I'm not talking to ministers as such, to preachers. I'm talking to housewives, to students, as well as pastors and evangelists that may be listening to this tape. I'm talking about that verse in Hebrews, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And you have a race to run, and you have a fight to fight, and a wrestling match to engage yourself in. And God will hold you responsible someday for that course of life that he's caused you. He's directed that you should, uh, appointed that you should run. So these are the five reasons, then, that we should do what we do for Jesus' sake. Because of the judgment seat of Christ, because of the need of sinners, because of the terror of the Lord, lest we displease him, because of the love of Christ, and because of the power of of the gospel. All right, now, another major factor in the ministry of the Lord, it is to be a representative one. I like that song, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. It's a representative one, and, and we are ambassadors for Christ. And you see, uh, the key job, the only job of an ambassador, is to faithfully represent his master or his government in a foreign land. Uh, for that reason, I believe that uh, Jesus will come and at the rapture and receive all his own before, all Christians, before the tribulation takes place, because the tribulation is a time of all-out war. 
and God is going to declare war on this earth. But the last thing a king or a president usually does before he calls his ambas before he declares war on another country, he calls his ambassadors home. And we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives. And so before he declares war, he's going to call his ambassadors home. We have these three thoughts about an ambassador. Ambassador number one must be a citizen of the state that he represents. Now, uh, if you want to represent the United States someday uh, in Germany, you have to be a citizen of the United States. Uh, the President of the United States will never, who appoints the ambassadors, will never appoint a Russian citizen living in Russia to represent our government in Cuba. He'd never do that. He couldn't do that. It'd be unconstitutional. Ambassadors must come from, or at that time, live in the state that they are to represent. And you and I cannot represent Christ unless we belong to him. So it's imperative to understand this, and a lot of people try to represent Christ who never belonged to him, and they imitate him and do the things that he did and try to live a good life, but, but they can't represent him to others because they themselves do not know him personally. So he must be a citizen of the state he represents. And secondly, he is chosen. Jesus said, ye have not chosen me, John 15, but I've chosen you, and I've ordained you. And again, I am a citizen of the United States, but I cannot uh, tomorrow go to Washington and say, well, I decide I'm going to be, I'd always wanted to be an ambassador, so I want to tell you, Mr. President, so that you'll, as if I could get in to see him in the first place, but if I could, I just want to let you know, so you know what's going on, I uh, will be assuming the new post as ambassador uh, to uh, the court in St. James, in, uh, in London, England, and I'll be the new American ambassador there. Well, I probably wouldn't be, you see, because I would not take this position to myself. I would have to be appointed, have to be chosen. And the third thing about an ambassador, he is called home, and we've already discussed this, before war is declared. That's why we feel, and these verses here, why are you a pre-tribulational premillennialist, Wilmington? Well, I am because of the fact that I'm an ambassador for Christ. And I realize that tribulation is a type, a time of all-out war, but God's going to call me home uh, to my country in heaven, where I have a heavenly country, and a building not made with human hands before he declares war upon this war earth. And therefore, I am not only a premillennialist, but I am a pre-tribulational premillennialist. The next area in the successful ministry, it is to be a blameless one. Chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And Paul says, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. You know, the Bible has suffered so much at the hands of its friends. It's been said that a hypocrite, and I believe it, will keep far more people from Christ than will a Hitler, you see. A carnal man will do uh, immense damage to the cause of Christ, damage that a Madeleine Murray O'Hare or a Joe Stalin or a bartender or a harlot could not do. So it is to be a blameless one. And of course, the reason for this is that so often we judge a movement or a position or a creed, not by the creed itself. Maybe that's unfair. We should do that. But we're not speaking of what people should do, but what people do do. We judge it not by what it says, but by the followers of that creed. And uh, if I uh, go into a certain store and I am ill-treated and cheated, I may not even uh, go to the manager to complain, but I'll judge that store and I'll judge the management of that store through one sloppy, uh, critical, arrogant, careless employee of that store. And how sad it is that there will be people in hell 
not because they were that much against the gospel, even though they're responsible for it, of course, but because of the shabby lives that so many believers, true believers, have demonstrated to them. Jesus said that we should let our light so shine before men that others might see our good works, you see, and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Someone has been rightly said that uh, your neighbor may not read the Bible in Morocco or Persian leather, but he can help but read it and view it and see it in shoe leather. So it is to be a blameless ministry. There's another reason for this also I don't have in my notes. The gospel by itself is offensive. There's no doubt about that. There's no way you can water it down. There's no way you can... Uh, soften it. I mean, if it's boldly proclaimed, you tell a sinner that he's helpless to save himself, that he is an enemy, enmity with God, and that the wrath of God abides upon him, that unless he repents, he's going to go to a devil's hell and burn forever and ever, there, that his righteousness, the very best things he can do in God's sight, are as filthy rags. And brother or sister, I want to tell you, that's offensive. So the gospel is offensive enough the way it is, because it's true, of course, without the believer making it more offensive. So it is to be a blameless ministry. And then we have, <clears throat> it is to be a paradoxical one. A paradox, of course, is an apparent but not real contradiction. And the Bible lists a number of these paradoxes. And a number of these are found, interestingly enough, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, especially 2nd Corinthians. Notice these paradoxes, and this is what is involved in the ministry here, of finding one's life and yet to lose it eventually. Uh, some people like Hugh Hefner and the rest, they find real life down here. They live it up, and their lifestyle is fantastic. If it feels good, do it. So they find the good life, the American way of life, so to speak. But eventually, those who find it will lose it. There are others, though, that the world never looks at twice, and, and uh, they work so hard for the Lord and don't seem to make any money. And as far as the world is concerned, they've flipped over religion, and they've lost the real life as far as eating and drinking and living it up. And yet to lose one's life for Christ is to eventually find it. I remember the words, as I'm sure you do too, of Jim Elliott, the martyred missionary in <clears throat> South America a number of years ago, one of the five that were murdered. And he said, he wrote years ago, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to receive that which he cannot lose. Let me stop and amplify that. <clears throat> God asks us, on occasion, no doubt about it, to give up a number of things, and we need to realize that. Being a Christian isn't a bed of roses or a bowl of cherries. Sometimes there's a lot of heartache involved. But the thing is this, <clears throat> God never ask, asks us to give up anything that we could keep in the long run anyway. Well, <clears throat> you say, he, he may ask me to give up my money. Well, you're, gonna give, you're gonna lose your money anyway someday. You're gonna lose it. Well, he may ask me to give up my wealth. And nobody ever took it with him. Some have tried, but you're going to lose that. Well, he may ask me to give up my family. They're going to leave you eventually. By that, I mean your kids are going to grow up and get married and move away, die or whatever. You're going to lose them as far as uh, personal contact with them. Normally, that's going to happen. Well, yes, but well, he may ask me to give up my life. Uh, well, and nature, Mother Nature is going to take care of that regardless of whether God does or not. See, he never asks you to give up anything that you can keep. So again, that statement, and oh, if God ever inspired another verse in the Bible, which he hasn't, of course, but if he ever added another verse, which he won't, I think it'd be that verse that Jim Elliott wrote, that little statement, he's no fool who gives up what he cannot, that which he cannot keep, like health and wealth and life itself, to receive that which he cannot lose. So, a paradox of finding one's life and yet to lose it, of losing one's life and yet to find it. And then 2 Corinthians 6, 9, of being unknown, 
as far as the world's concerned down here, and yet to be well-known, well-known in heaven. Of dying, yet to possess life. These are found in 2 Corinthians 6. Of being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Of dying, yet able to give life. Jesus said he had to die in order that he might give life. That's a paradox, an apparent contradiction. But, of course, it's a glorious reality of being sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, of being poor and yet making many rich, of having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paradox is found in 2 Corinthians 6. Of hearing words that cannot be expressed, 2 Corinthians 12. Of being strong when one is weak. That's what Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. What did he mean by that? Well, he meant that when he realized how weak he was, then he had to depend upon God, and he was uh, unbelievably strong then in the power of the Lord. Of knowing the love of Christ, Paul says in Ephesians, which surpasses knowledge, and then in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, of seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, the unseen. These are contradictions, uh, apparent contradictions, paradoxical uh, elements in the ministry here. And then in your notes, you'll notice we, by way of conclusion, have said that the very life and ministry of our blessed Savior was itself one long, unending paradox. For example, he hungered. That was one of his first major crises. Remember in Matthew 4, he went 40 days without food, and yet he fed the multitudes. He turned the the uh, few fishes and the loaves uh, into enough bread to feed 5,000 and fishes hungry men in uh, John chapter 6, and yet he would not turn stones into bread in Matthew 4. He hungered, yet failed, fed multitudes. He thirsted, remember on the cross, he said, I thirst, and yet he is, as he told the Samaritan woman, the water of life. He wearied. He was so tired in John 4, Jesus was weary, and he sat on Jacob's well. Another time we're told that he, that he uh, fell asleep amidst a storm, pushing and the, the uh, rocking back and forth and the shoving of a boat didn't wake him up. He was exhausted. He wearied, and yet he said, Come unto me, all ye that are uh, weary and, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wearied, and yet he is our rest, a paradox. He paid tribute. He told Simon Peter to go down and catch a fish, and there would be a coin in that fish's mouth. He paid tribute to an earthly king, and yet he is the king of kings and lord of lords, a paradox. He prayed in the garden, and yet he hears our prayers. He wept over Jerusalem and over the body of Lazarus, and yet he dries our tears. One of the last chapters in the Bible, next to the last chapter, and God himself shall wipe away all tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, and yet he redeems the world. He was led, according to Isaiah 53, as a sheep to the slaughter, and yet he says, I am the good shepherd. He was put to death, and yet he raises the dead. Oh, it's such a paradoxical. We don't understand all the glories and perhaps all the invisible battles wrought by angels and demons alike over our ministry. It's a paradoxical one. Someday, in 1 Corinthians 13, we shall know as we are known. God will explain all these things. Now, Paul says in chapter 6, verses 11 to 18, it is to be a separated ministry. And I want to say this, it's a lonely life, being a full-time worker for Christ and even being a lay worker in a factory. If you take your stand, it's to be, it has to be by the very nature of this ministry, it has to be a separated one. Notice the nature of this separation, verse 14 of chapter 6, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. As a minister of Christ, whether I'm a lay person or a paid full-time worker, uh, I am to be separated unto God from the world. And this separation would no doubt cover such human ties as marriage, 
No unsaved person has any right whatsoever to expect God to bless them. Uh, no saved person, I should say, has your right to expect God to bless them if they deliberately marry an unsaved person. Now, God may, in his goodness and his grace, save that partner, but normally it's not the saved influencing the unsaved. It's almost always the other way around. The unsaved influences the saved. So it should be separated when it comes to marriage. And then concerning certain business partnerships, I do not think it's scriptural for a saved person to go into full-time business partnership with an unsaved person. And then certainly this refers to unsound ecclesiastical organizations as uh, the Thomas Road Baptist Church down here. We do not feel that we can have any fellowship whatsoever with the National Council or the World Council of Churches. And as a member of an independent Baptist church, I didn't feel that I could associate uh, with the ministerial, someone said assassination in my group and my area. I attended once or twice just to see what it was about. And frankly, for no other reason, I got tired of airing out my coat from the cigarette smoke because that's the first thing a lot of them did is lit up their pipes and their cigarettes. And, and uh, I got a little weary of hearing some of the uh, off-color jokes that were told. And so, but I had no business after a couple of times being there anyway because of the scripture verse here of being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, Paul hits home with some indisputable logic here, I think, concerning the separation. He said, what fellowship hath righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or Christ with the devil? or the believers with unbelievers, or the temple of God with the temple of idols. And the book of Amos, God says, can two agree except they walk together? And of course, that answer is still no. So the ministry is to be a separated one. Now again, it's almost a paradox, is to be a universal one where to, uh, where to go out and, and attempt to witness to the world so our, uh, our message is not to be a separated one. That is to say we're just to speak to a certain group of Baptist people uh, or a certain group of Americans. We're not to send missionaries. So the message is universal. But the ministry itself, in my personal life, is to be a separated one. Notice the rewards of this separation. God always rewards us for those things he causes us to do if we're faithful. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 6, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We have to beware lest this separation wall that should be about our lives break down, as it did in the case of, of Lot. Do you remember uh, Lot had a friendship with the world? First, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then there was a love for the world. He moved into Sodom. And then there was a conformity to the world in that he became an alderman, a councilman, as it were. And later he lost his family because he was not separated unto the Lord and from the wicked men of Sodom. Now, thus far... We've seen, concerning Paul's approach here, his consolation, chapters 1, verses 1 to 7, his explanation, he explains his travail in Asia, his trip to Macedonia, his tears in Ephesus, that's chapter 1, verses 8, through chapter 2, verse 13, and then consolation, explanation, demonstration. We've looked at these various things that he says about the ministry. It is to demonstrate the following elements. It's to be a triumphal one, a sincere, an approved one, a dependent one, superior one, open one. It's a Christ-honoring, suffering. It's a confident one. It's a compelling one, a representative one, a paradoxical one, and a separated one. So we've seen now consolation, these great words in Paul's epistles here, Paul's epistle, consolation, explanation, demonstration, and now gratification. In chapter 7, 
We've already discussed this somewhat in the opening verses, in the opening comments of our study. Paul was gratified for two things. Number one, and he discusses this in chapter 7, upon seeing Titus. Remember, Titus was supposed to meet him at Macedonia. Let me give you the review there. Paul wrote a letter and sent it to the church at Corinth, and he sent Titus to find out how things were going there because he'd heard some disturbing rumors. And he said, you go there and I'll meet you in Macedonia. I can't go there now, but uh, they left Ephesus together and Paul went one direction and Timothy or Titus went another direction. And he goes to, uh, uh, to Corinth and he doesn't somehow there, they don't get together at Macedonia. And Paul says, uh, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. He said, I was literally beside myself. I was just torn up. Now, when I first started the ministry, I thought, well, if I ever am concerned about anything, uh, then it's I'm not serving God. And, and if I ever have any anxiety, any pressure, it simply means that I'm out of the will of God. But I don't believe that at all now. Uh, Paul here uh, was literally beside himself. He said his flesh had no rest. He was troubled, and within, without were fightings, within were fears. Uh, sometimes the believer is subjected to severe harassment from the devil, and sometimes from, uh, from physical infirmities to the point where he thinks he's going to climb the wall or froth at the mouth or roll on the floor. He just... Did you ever feel like you just want to get out somewhere by yourself and just scream at the top of your voice? Uh, well, I have too. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're out of the will of God. It means that God allows us <clears throat> to go through these things uh, till we get to the end of our rope that we might then fully depend upon him. But he was so gratified later on <clears throat> when he did meet up with Timothy that he writes about this. And then... He was not only gratified upon the fact of seeing Titus, but in the same chapter he says, <clears throat> I was doubly gratified when I heard him. <clears throat> Just to see him brought joy to my heart, <clears throat> but when I heard him, it brought a song to my lips because the message, of course, that Titus gave him was, hey, they've got things straightened out there. That letter that you wrote to them uh, pretty well uh, uh, brought them back into the place of blessing. And uh, so he is, uh, he's, he's so gratified here. Uh, and then the next great area out of the six areas that we've talked about, consolation, explanation, demonstration, gratification, is solicitation. Yeah, I thought Paul was a Baptist preacher. He's taking the offering now, isn't he? Well, he doesn't mention a lot about money uh, as much as he does about the spirit in back of it. In fact, he talks about, he gives an example of giving and the spirit of giving, the, res the grace of giving, the results of giving, uh, and things like this. And I think that if the child of God could fully understand these chapters here in verses 8 and 9, that the minister would never have to even ask for an offering again. There are some churches, not very many, I know one in Florida where they never take up an offering. I'm not saying that uh, I've never done this, uh, and that you should not do it. Obviously, we do at Thomas Road quite often, but that uh, they just a box in the back, and the pastor has so instilled these two chapters, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, in the hearts and minds of his people, uh, that uh, they, uh, he never mentions money, never even says, now, folks, don't forget we're not going to take an offering but there's a box in the back there and but he's so he's hammered at this so hard that that they automatically fill that box up once a week now again i'm not saying you're out of the will of god if you don't pass that offering plate pastor because in my 18 years in the ministry i don't think i ever forgot to do that but i am saying that there's another angle at this also and i think we need to stress uh what paul hits here in chapters eight and nine and we'll be talking about that during the fourth and final lecture of this wonderful book.